First Kings chapter 17 verses 1 through 8. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. Uh -huh. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from the brook, mm. and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, mm. for he went and stayed by the brook Cherith, which mm. flows into the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he mm. drank from the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Mm. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, mm. which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed, a widow was there gathering sticks. You stop right there, my friend. How are you feeling about last week's collapse of a few historic companies? I don't need this. <laughs> How you feeling about it? How you feeling about all the paranoia in the media? Oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. How are you feeling about the closing of a few banks even in Las Vegas? How do you feel about the change in the value of your home? Maybe it was once valued at this, now it's gone down. How do you feel about the rise of unemployment, the price of gasoline, the price, the Iranian threat to destroy Israel? I don't know if you've been reading about that. Do these big news items shake you up or do they cause you to fear? Do they, do they speak death to you? Do, it, does it, do they cause you to worry and be anxious or even edgy or blaming? Or do they stir you up to pray, to fast, to give, to seek God, to reprioritize, to repent for mistakes, to seek God's wisdom? I'm telling you, this, the, the title that I was getting is, Are You Shaken or Are You Stirred? I remember when I was young, I used to watch those old, old James Bond movies. And he used to like his drinks, what? Shaken, shaken and not stirred. But you know what? I don't want to be shaken by the news. I want to be stirred by the news. I don't want any of these things to shake me because I'm led by the Holy Spirit. I'm full of the Holy Spirit. I'm a child of God. I'm tapped into heaven. I've got the resources of heaven in my life. So I don't want to be shaken. I want to be stirred. Anybody with me on that? How many want to be stirred and not shaken? We don't want to be like James Bond. We want to be like Jesus. Everybody say, I want to be stirred and not shaken. The fifth pillar of a 100% walk is trust and faith. Psalm 20 verse 7 is so descriptive of what I'm talking about. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, Woo. but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. <laughs> I don't trust in chariots. I don't trust in Lehman Brothers. I don't trust in any of these places. I trust in God. I trust in God. We've got to become people that trust is the foundation of almost every single decision you'll ever make. Trust is the foundation. And all your decisions are based on this trust. You'll make your decisions based on trust or whether, on what you trust in and who you trust in. F trust will lead to decisions. Decisions will lead to actions. Actions will lead to reactions. And reactions will lead to results. So if you are a person that puts your trust in man or in government or in this company or this corporation, oh, my company's having cutbacks. Don't panic. Your trust isn't in them anyway. Oh, they're cutting back right now. I just heard about, I talked to a friend the other day and there's cutbacks at one of the casinos. You know what? Don't panic because that company, that casino or that doctor's office or whatever it might be is not my source. He's Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You got to decide where your trust is going to be in. Otherwise, you'll be shaken one day and shaken another. Just a few weeks ago, what was the big news? The $150 in oil barrel, $160. It's never been that way. Oh, God, the sky is falling. Oh! And then President Bush said, drill, drill, drill. 
And the, the, the pundits are saying, oh, that won't affect anything. That won't affect anything. Well, what happened is all of a sudden the price of gas starts going down because everybody's shouting, drill, drill, drill. And the people that control us, people that control us from the Middle East and Venezuela, they're freaking out. Say, oh, no, we don't want them to become independent. We don't want them to become America to be to be not dependent on us. We love their dependence on us. Let's lower the price quickly before they actually do something about it. Uh, okay, you're not getting this. I'm getting it. You understand what I'm saying? Why did they lower the price? I'll tell you why. It was because we start threatening to become more independent, and all of a sudden they go, oh, my God, let's lower it before they actually start drilling again, start finding more better resources, start tapping into gasoline in Alaska and all these other things we should be doing, and we should have been doing it 20 years ago. 1980, when I was at the gas pumps, long gas pump lines, I remember all these things. I remember it, and it took us 28 years to finally wake up. Thank you. Now, I want to take a closer look at this scripture. When it says that in 1 Kings chapter 1, when we look at Elijah, the word Elijah literally means Jehovah is my God. Who is your God? Because your God is the person or thing you trust in. If you trust in your company, the company has become your God. If you, if you base your trust on your husband or, or, or a politician or something like that, they become your gods. There can only be one God. And you put your trust in that God. And the Bible literally says that he was a, uh, he, that Elijah was, um, what does it say? He was a Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead. There's one version, I was reading the commentaries, it literally means he was a stranger among strangers. In other words, Elijah just kind of popped out of nowhere. <laughs> and, and because that place does not even exist right now, and they don't even know if it ever existed, it's not repeated one more time in the Bible. So they say actually the interpretation should be he was a stranger among strangers. He just popped out of nowhere to be a prophetic voice. Maybe that's why God put you in that company, for you to be a prophetic voice. Maybe that's why you're in this church, because you're a prophetic voice. He popped out of nowhere, and God wants to pop us in our city. He wants us to have more and more of a say. I look forward to the day where one of our members is actually the mayor of Las Vegas. I don't know who that's going to be. Anybody want to be the mayor of Las Vegas? I sat with someone the other day, he wants to be governor. I say, praise the Lord, because he's my friend. I am praying that more and more and more, you guys are making decisions about our city, about our state, about our nation. You're making decisions about what's on television and what's not on television. I'm praying that you become the great executive, the next great inventor. Come on! Yeah. I'm praying that you begin to take these seven mountains. Yeah. I truly believe that, because Elijah popped out of nowhere. I think Governor Palin popped out of nowhere. She came from Alaska. <laughs> I like that. You know what's funny? She's a good little Assemblies God girl. You know, I, I've been connected to several groups through the years, and we have like people that we march with. I've been marching with the Assemblies of God for 25 years. That's one of my tribes. And she was raised and trained in a church just like ours, raised up. To, to be a potential vice president. I think that's crazy God working because God wants to do crazy things in these last days. I'm looking forward to today. We have a born again, spirit filled, uh, good old Pentecostal president. And I'm looking forward, forward to the day where Democrats, I'm looking forward to the day where Democrats and Republicans are born again, spirit filled, led by God. And then he says something interesting. He says, as the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. What does that say? Elijah was intimate with God. He was walking with God. Are you walking with God? If you're going to go through troubled times in an economy or a nation, I'm not in trouble right now. My nation might be, but I'm not because I'm a man of God. And I want to just challenge you. As the Lord lives, the Lord God of Israel, I stand with him. How many are standing with God today? Come on. Elijah prophesies a drought. See, the thing that's happening is God wants you to, he's going to start raising up prophetic type people like you and I, and we're going to start moving in the Democratic Party, in the Republican Party, and maybe even a third or fourth party there may be one day. But I believe that God's positioning men and women of God to politically start to rise up in city councils and in, in all these other political venues. I believe that God's raising up people in the business world to become prosperous so they can actually write checks for a million dollars or five million dollars to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that God's doing something new. And here you have Elijah who comes out of nowhere, prophesies a drought. Now the question is, was he making it happen through his prophecy or was he 
telling what God was already telling him. We're not exactly sure. We're going to talk more about that later. The next thing we see, because in Leviticus 26, 19, the Bible warns that if Israel has other gods, they would have a drought. It was a logical consequence of having other gods. When money is your god, wait for a drought. It's coming. I don't even have to be a prophet to tell you that. If a person's your god, wait for a drought. It's coming. I'm challenging you right now to look into the Word of God because this is a day where we should reevaluate who our God is. Did any of us see this eco economic collapse coming? My answer is yes. A person by the name of Burkett, is it Larry Burkett? Years ago, is, I think he's passed away, hasn't he? But years ago, I, I, I was raised on Larry Burkett. Become debt free. Debt free, debt free, lower your credit, lower your debt, keep going. And I just remember Burkett's prophetic theme through the years. Did anybody listen to that? And they'd say, you know, go ahead and buy a secondhand car. You know, don't uh, put your money in a depreciable asset. Go ahead and try to pay off even your mortgage one day, although he did allow for mortgages. But, but if he'd been alive in the last five years or three years, whatever, I don't remember when he died. But what would he have said? In Las Vegas, all of a sudden our home values went up, and instead of following lower credit, less, less loans, less debts, instead of lowering our debts, what do we do? We looked at the seemingly value of our homes and we go, get a second, get a second, get a second. Why? I want a big screen TV. I want a brand new car. I want to buy new shoes. I want this and I want that. All of a sudden we got seconds or thirds or fourths, and I'm in, I'm in the bucket too. And what happened is instead of following the counsel, the prophetic counsel we received in the 80s, we went with it because it looked like our homes were worth X amount. And we borrowed, we got into more debt based on what it looked like. But all of a sudden what happened? And all of a sudden we're going, oh God, I didn't see it. But that's okay because we can repent and say, God forgive me. I went along with the theme, I went along with the world, I went along with the currents, and I got myself in bad financial positions. Now, I didn't, but I'm saying a lot of people did that I know, and good people did. In fact, you can't tell me the people at Lehman Brothers and others, I, they're not all bad people. Some of them have MBAs and BBAs and PhDs and all the other things, but you know what? They're looking like morons right now. They feel like fools right now because they thought, they thought there was no lid on the ceiling of values of homes and properties going up, so they kept going, and they're good. some of them are really good people. Some of them are Christians. But we failed to follow the prophetic words back in the 80s, the lessons that we learned back in the 80s. See, there's good people that have hard, hard financial times right now. Good Christians, spirit-filled Christians. What should we do? We should say, sorry, Daddy. Sorry, Daddy, we got a little carried away. We really believe that they said the value of the home was this, when really it may not be the value of the home because it did change. We want to put our trust and value on real things. Is anybody with me on that? Is it okay to say we made some mistakes? Am I the only one that's ever made a mistake? Wave at me if I... We've all made mistakes. And it's okay to say, God, I made a mistake there. I'm going to wipe the dust off my pants and I'm going to rebuild my credit and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep low credit. I'm going to not borrow a lot of money. I'm going to do things smart from now on in. And you say, well, I lost $50,000. Call that your 50000 PhD. You're $50,000 smarter than you were six months ago. Say, so, well, I mean, what else you want to do? You want to beat yourself up the rest of your life? You want to get mad at God? You want to get, I mean, you, you can spend the rest of your life crying over the spilt milk. Or you can go, you know what? Yeah, I lost my home. Left. Let's go. I'm ready for my next challenge. God's forgiven me for my mistakes. I forgive because it was not just people made mistakes. The industry made horrible, horrible mistakes. But the point I'm making right now is these, this prophetic voice should be rising up in us, giving us cautions, and we should learn to trust God and not trust everything we hear in the media. The brook of Cherith is an interesting term. It literally means the torrent course. So, you know, I used to think brook of Cherith was a little tiny brook. No, it literally means a torrent. And so God leads him to like... This, this water that's going by, rushing by, and when, when, when the rains would come, the rainy season, that place was just a torrent, and he parked himself right next to that. And the Bible says the ravens fed him in the morning and in the evening. Now think about that for a second. Talk about an unlikely source, that God has ravens. I don't even like ravens. The other day I was up on Prairie Mountain, and I saw two ravens hover over the, the area there. And I thought, those are ugly birds. 
Maybe they're just a little decrepit because they live in the desert. Maybe ravens are beautiful, but these weren't beautiful ravens. And they're kind of they're kind of eerie, you know. It reminds me of Edgar Allan Poe. <laughs> Ask not for whom the toll, the bell tolls; it tolls for thee. Is that Poe or is that Shakespeare? I can't remember. I don't remember. I don't know. I was I had a minor in English in university. That was a few years ago. But when I'm talking about this, I want you to hear what I'm saying. It, God brings them to a brook, and ravens are feeding them in the night. Now, now the earliest versions of the Old Testament, the word literally is ravens. But as time went on, it's very interesting. Guess what the, uh, some of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, transcript writers change it to? They change it to merchants or Arabs, Arabians. So at first, it was super miraculous. Ravens literally fed him. But as the years went on, the text changed because it made it more parable because they didn't really believe in the supernatural. But when you look at a translation, you want to go to the original, the most, the most oldest version of the New Testament. That's what you want to base your translations on. Anybody all with me on that? Am I going too fast? Okay. I want to talk about 10 lessons we learned from Elijah. And I'm just going to share a few with you this morning. In the next nine minutes, I've got probably two or three of them. And then I'm going to give you probably two or three more tonight and maybe continue on. So I want you to write down the 10 lessons that we can learn from Elijah. Elijah prophesied a drought. In other words, he saw it coming. Friends, my prayer for you and I, we see things coming before they happen. How, Rob, you want to do that? How many want to see things before they're coming? Before they happen. I want to see things before they come. I thank God for my wife because during this great, you know, buying houses left and right, I wanted to buy a house. We went ahead, I put money down, and we were going to get another house, and we're going to do this and that, and blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden, my wife started going, oh, her prophetic voice started rising up. And uh, I said, baby, I'm going to lose my deposit. And she said, oh, and I said, okay, oh. So I kissed my deposit goodbye. We walked away from it because of a prophetic warning. Did I have the warning? No, but God gave me a wife that gave me a warning. So thank God when I was blinded by this, you know, feeding piranha frenzy, is my wife actually had enough sense to go, oh, 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 oh. Anybody relate to what I'm saying? I'm saying in a positive sense, of course. Did Elijah make this drought happen or did he see it coming? Was it a demonstration of his authority? or an affirmation of God's coming judgment. Notice that the drought was going to hit everyone, even him. Innocent people sometimes suffer from droughts. So the economy right now is tenuous. The government is saying we're going to come in with, what, $8 billion or $800 billion to try to bail out these industries. And, and you know what? It seems to stabilize the stock market. But I want to tell you something, friends. What goes up must come down, and what's down will eventually go back up. And if we allow ourselves to be driven emotionally by the media. The media is whacked out right now. They are, I can't even, I have a hard time watching news right now because they're so ravenous and piranha-like in anything they get a hold of. It's just, it's absurd. It's absurd, the media right now. And, and, and a lot of times they'll just do things and then, you know, later on they'll, they'll, they'll have to repent of it or they don't even repent. They, they, just a, a little byword in the newspaper. Literally, if they wanted to, they could almost destroy anyone's life because people believe the media. And the media is very powerful because they're making stars. Paris Hilton, she's not a star, but they've made her a star. They pay her hundreds of thousands of dollars just to make an appearance here or there. She's become a star, and then you have these other lesser known uh, TV stars or movie stars becoming huge stars because TMZ is following them everywhere and asking them questions. And the other day I saw this show TMZ for a few moments when I was working out, I'm thinking, who is that? But they're becoming a big star because they're at that club or at that bar or, or they're getting drunk and falling down or they're, they're hitting a cameraman or something like that. And I'm thinking, this is a distorted, distorted culture. I don't like our culture right now. I don't want them to govern my life. I don't want to worship Paris Hilton. I don't want to worship Britney Spears. I don't want to put, va you know, I pray for them, but they, I don't trust them. Okay, thank you. I thought it was a good point. I'm preaching right now. Anybody notice that I'm preaching? Elijah prophesied a drought. And I'm praying from now on, you and I are tuned in 
I'm, I want to be so tuned in that I see these things coming and I want to prophesy them. But you know, the Bible also de de declares that if I declare it, God will establish. Sometimes when I prophesy, I make history happen. The second principle I saw, second lesson, is God always has a plan to help direct his people. Let's read that verse again. Then uh, verse 2 and 3, please. Then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook Cherith, which flows into the Jordan. Mm. God leads them to an unlikely place. God always has a plan to help you and direct you. Say it with me. God always has a plan to help me and direct me. Why? Because you're a child of God. Someone say, I'm a child of God. He loves me. See, why well, I made mistakes during that whole ravenous piranha thing. That's okay. Lots of people did. And God doesn't want to punish you. God wants to bless you and give you a way of escape. He wants to start blessing you even in a situation that may be difficult. If you're in the housing industry, I believe that you can become a Daniel or a Joseph. You, through your wisdom by the Holy Spirit, can actually help your company navigate different difficult times. And your, make, your company may survive simply because you're a man of God or a woman of God directing your team. I'm telling you right now, we've been positioned where we are to lead people by the Spirit through difficult times. We're not naysayers. We're not like the, the spies that went into the promised land and came back with a bad report. We're the spies that go and say, we can take it. We can take it. We can change it. We can turn it around. You go to work, instead of going to work saying, I might lose my job today, and therefore acting out of fear every day. Instead, you go to work going, how could they let go of someone as awesome as me? You go to school and say, oh, I'm going to fail this test, I'm going to fail this test. You go and say, I've been praying, I've been studying God, anoint my mind, and even remind me of things I never studied. That's the only way I cheat when I take a test. No, oh, ah, it's true. The only way I cheat is say, oh God, I know I didn't study everything and I tried really, really hard, but show me stuff I didn't even know. Because God wants to lead me and bless me and guide me, and that's what he wants to do for you. He wants to lead you to new sources of supply. Here's the prophetic word. This is a prophetic sermon, by the way, if you haven't noticed. God's leading you to a new source of supply and commands creation to care for the men and women of God. Oof. I don't know about you. You receive that. Thank you. Anybody else receive that here? I'll say it again. God leads you to a new source of supply and commands creation, commands your boss, commands a company, commands a board of directors to bless you. God has the ability to command so that the children of God begin to be the head and not the tail. This is our season, friends. He'll do the same for you. Thirdly and finally. God's solutions and directions are generally outside the box. <laughs> Contrary to human wisdom, even supernatural sometimes, they require faith and trust in order to obey. I remember the old hymn, trust and obey, for there's no other way if you're happy in Jesus. Trust and obey. 1 Corinthians 1.25. Could you read that, please, my friend? I know you weren't ready with that scripture, but we're going to start landing this plane. Because this third principle is so powerful. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 25. God's solutions and directions are generally outside the box. Check it out. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. <laughs> I was watching when I was working out last night, uh, I was watching Deal or No Deal. And here this person had two $1 million uh, opportunities left, and the rest was like $25, $50, and, and $100. So she was either going to get $25, $75, $100, or $300, I think it was, dollars, or $2 million prizes. And the offer for her to turn away from that was $244,000. And here I am working out with my headphones on going, take the 244, take the 244. I'm literally shouting it out, not even noticing, because I was the only one left in the gym that late, and no one else was there, and I'm literally shouting it out except for the worker that was in the other room, and I'm shouting it out. 
And here comes her counselors. Honey, go for it. Just go for it. Just, you got, you got, uh, uh, you know, if, if you miss it and you get the one million, it's still going to be a million left and, and the, the, the offer is not going to go down. I'm going, no, the offer is going to go down a lot. Don't do it, girl. Take the money. <laughs> All her counselors said the same thing. No, don't take $244,000 for sure. Gamble it away. And you're going to get, you're going to get more money. Talk about the wisdom of the world. What does she do? And I'm cringing. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually mad at all her counselors. I'm saying, you guys are stupid. So, no, no, seriously. I'm going, no wonder you guys are all poor. You're stupid. A fool and his money soon depart. I'm serious. I'm, I'm being totally stupid in this, this workout center, but I was alone. So I had freedom to go, they're stupid. Don't be that stupid. Come on, please. Let's do something smart. What does she do? No deal. Rejects the 244000 And guess what? The next one she picked was a million. So guess what? Her offer goes down to 130 something thousand. In one shot, she lost hundred about $110,000. And now, guess what? Now all her counselors are going, I, I, I think maybe you should make the deal. I think maybe you should make the deal. I think maybe you should make the deal. Hey, maybe you should make the deal. A moment ago, they go, no, go all the way, man. Risk, risk, risk. Because in the case that you chose originally, there's a million dollars. Well, guess what? There was only a hundred dollars in that case. If she'd kept going, she would have walked away with a hundred dollars instead of 244. It was bad enough that she walked away with a hundred and thirty something thousand versus 244. But the point was, is that a fool and his money soon depart. And God's solutions are not the world's solutions. And you can put that, those three points up there again, please. See, God's wisdom, God's foolishness is man's wisdom. And man's wisdom is God's foolishness. You know, God has a way for you to get out of debt, and God has a way for you to improve your marriage, and God has a way for you to find the man of your dreams or the woman of your dreams. God has a way to do it, and it's probably going to be 100% uh, diametrical to the world. It's going to be in opposition because... I think Pastor Joe, you said this, there's a cultural collision right now. Cultural collision. Type, and that's what's happening right now. Rick, there's a cultural collision. In other words, the ways of God are confronting the ways of the Spirit right now. It is so evident, I've never seen it that severe. So I want to challenge you before we go today. I want you to tap into the Holy Spirit like never before. Because we're at a place right now, if we want 100% walk, DeAndre, we can have 100% queuing into the Spirit of God. And we can begin to walk out in the Spirit of God and learn to walk in prosperity even in a season of drought because I'm contrary to the society. I work against the society. I love the people, but I hate the culture. Amen. And I could spend the next four hours and saying why I hate the culture, but I won't do that because it's in opposition to the Spirit of God. The acts of the flesh are in opposition to the acts of the Spirit. And so if we declare today we're going to be people of the Spirit and we're going to learn from the lessons of Elijah so we'll prosper even in a drought. If you want to prosper even in a drought, I want you to stand up. Come on. Oh, I feel, have you noticed that I'm kind of just preaching with lots of fire lately? I've been in morning prayer almost every single morning, and I'll tell you what, my spiritual wick is on fire. I feel like someone stuck a hot pack of dynamite in my rear end, my shorts. It's just, that's what I meant. I'm on, seriously on fire. <laughs> this coming Thursday, we're going to start a fast. And we're going to, we're going to fast all the way to the call, San Diego, November 1st. And, I, and I'm just going to encourage you guys. Why fast? Because I'm, I'm going against the culture. I, it's doing something different that the culture doesn't do. We're going to fast to bring down heaven in the elections. We're going to fast to bring down elect. We're going to fast. We're going to fast to bring prosperity into homes again. We're going to fast to bring godliness in homes again. We're going we're gonna to pray and fast, pray and fast, pray and fast. Some of you are going to start coming to 7 a.m. prayer and join the army that's already joining us because you just want to do something different to, because we can learn from Elijah's example. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I shout it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, worship team, come on up. And I want everybody to do this. Take, I want you to turn to your husband or wife. 
and I want you to turn to somebody you know. I don't want you to hold hands as a whole group. I want you to turn to one person and begin to pray. Come on. Turn to one person and begin to pray. And, and man, I'm feeling the fire of God. I feel like a keg of dynamite in my shorts and in my heart. Like Jeremiah says, I have a fire burning in my heart. I cannot contain it. Now, you know, friends, we're going to part two tonight. So I encourage you to come back tonight. But I want to do this. Pray for that person, that they're going to be so in tune with the Spirit of God. If you need to repent for mistakes, let's, come on, let's not dwell on guilt anymore. Just say, Lord, forgive me right now in Jesus' name. I've made mistakes. I've made mistakes, but I want to change. I've made mistakes, but I want to change. I've made mistakes. I've missed your cues, but I want to get, I want to become more sensitive to the Spirit of God. I want to stand with God. Come on, pray, 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 pray. Pray, covenant together. Whoa! God has a plan to help you and direct you. God wants to tip you off. God's solutions are different than the world's solutions. You're going to think outside the box, contrary to human wisdom. Even you're going to have supernatural wisdom. If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God. He'll give freely. You got to trust and obey. Have faith in God's rewarding provision. Whoa, I feel his presence in this place. I feel his presence in this place. I'm going to need to let you go, but I want to pray for you first. So hold on to a bunch of hands now. Lord, I declare, I prophesy that for the men and women of God, you're going to bring us to new sources and resources. I pray that you help us think outside the box, and I release heaven on everyone here. Forgive us for our mistakes and start the change today. Today. We don't follow the world's standards men and women of faith. So we release faith on you right now. And Lord, I trust you. I trust you for my provision and their provision. I'm telling you, I'm feeling the release of heaven on you. And we're going to do this. I want you to look up for one moment before we go. There's some of you that literally feel drawn to run to this altar. Come on. If you feel drawn to come and give your life to God, you feel calm to lay your burdens down, whatever it is, if you just know I can't leave without spending time at the altar. Lord, I bless everyone here, those that come to the altar and those that have to go. Friends, I love you. Have fun in Sunday school. I'll see you tonight at 6 o'clock. God bless you. Either come to the altar or go home. I love you.
came to this altar, they're hungry for more of you. And we release those that had to leave, and we bless them for those that are in this place right now. I want you to go ahead, the word of the Lord is to dig a well right now. If you're at this altar, or maybe you want to come to this altar, start digging a well. I really believe the Spirit of God is saying, dig the well right now. Even by coming to this altar, you're digging a well. I don't care if there's 10 people or 100. It doesn't matter. We're going to dig wells here. Worship team, just keep going. I feel we're supposed to dig some wells for the 11 o'clock service. Let's dig it so it's a gusher. It's a gusher. Come on, if you can, come to this altar. If you're just walking in, come to this altar. Put your books on the, the seat. Come and worship. Show. 